today. Um, our webinar is titled Financial Literacy, Partnerships and Pivoting to Virtual Programming During a Pandemic. And we are so glad that you all could be here today. Um, hopefully you've taken a moment to introduce yourself in the chat box. So as you'll notice, our presenters today have mic access. Um, the uh, attendees do not. So please type any questions you have in the chat box. Make sure you select all panelists and attendees to make sure that everyone sees your questions if you want that to be the case. If you're having any technical issues, please post those in the Q&A box. Um, and uh, my colleague Hannah will try to assist you. Um, please don't post technical issues in the chat box because they may get lost amongst the questions. Um, there will be time for a Q&A at the end, but like I said, please feel free to throw your questions in the chat as we go. We will be recording this session and we will send out a link to all of the uh, registrants within 48 hours. And you'll be able to find that uh, recording going forward on programminglibrarian.org. Um, that is a website of ALA's Public Programs Office. And just look under the Learning tab. We have dozens and possibly hundreds of webinars uh, pre-recorded there that you can choose from. I want to give a quick thanks to our sponsor. Um, today's webinar is part of a series created by ALA's Financial Literacy Interest Group and sponsored by the FINRA Investor Education Foundation. So a huge thanks to the FINRA Foundation and to the Financial Literacy Interest Group. And with that, I am going to uh, turn off my video and pass things over to Emily Ross. And Emily, please tell me if I mispronounced your last name. I'm sorry, I should have checked that first. <laughs> nope, that was great. Thank you. Great. <laughs> and I know that Robert from the FINRA Foundation is here with us today. So thank you for joining us, Robert. And thank you so much for the FINRA Foundation support for everything um, that it provides for the Financial Literacy Interest Group. So I am the chair of the Financial Literacy Interest Group, and I'm currently the business librarian and library outreach coordinator at Penn State Harrisburg in central Pennsylvania. Next slide. I just wanna share briefly with everyone a little bit about the Financial Literacy Interest Group if you have not heard of us before. Uh, we are a group for librarians from any type of library. So school, special, public, academic, everyone is welcome. And we're just a place for people who are interested in financial literacy for their patrons, um, be it children to adults. Um, I've even met some people that work with financial literacy for incarcerated individuals. So we really welcome any type of library and librarian who's interested in what type of financial literacy resources they can provide to their population. To join us, it's very easy. Uh, you can join us via ALA Connect. So that's connect.ala.org. And that's where we post uh, most of our information. We will often hold meetings at midwinter and annual. That's gotten a little strange lately with all of the changes um, in where those are being held. Um, and if you would like to join our mailing list, you'll be informed about once a month about our upcoming webinars, um, call for bloggers, things like that. So any events that are coming up, if you send me an email and I'll put that in the chat when I'm done speaking, I'll add you to that email list and anyone can go into ALA Connect if you're an ALA member and join us in um, ALA Connect. Next slide. Just a quick overview of the types of things that we offer. Um, every other month on average, we will have a free webinar, um, usually given by a FLIG member to talk about programming, success, challenges, things that they've done around financial literacy in their library. So you are at one of them now. Thank you for joining us. And we send notifications about these uh, webinars out to our email list and also through ALA Connect. This year, we've also started a monthly blogging series with the Programming Librarian blog. Um, so we've had really great posts so far from librarians at a bunch of different libraries um, on timely topics about you know, how to pivot to online. Um, during the holidays, we had some ideas for virtual um, low cost gift sessions that you could do. And we have some really great sessions planned for the rest of the year as well. Um, so those are all at programminglibrarian.org. And as I mentioned, we would generally have a, um, a speaker both at midwinter and a program at annual. Um, I don't know what that is going to look like yet for the summer, uh, but once we know the details about um, if we are meeting and where that will be and who will be speaking for us, we'll be sharing that out to connect and the email list once it's available. 
So now I would like to introduce today's speaker. You can go to the next slide, I think. Uh, Marty is the career and personal finance librarian for uh, Johnson County, Kansas Library. She coordinates a career and finance committee to support job seekers and to promote financial literacy through programming, career and finance boards and binders, a monthly e-newsletter, research web pages, and partnerships with community organizations. I'm gonna turn it over to Marty now, and we will have some questions throughout the program to learn a little bit more about all of you. Um, so please uh, chat, type in the chat when those come up. Thank you, Marty, for joining us and thank you so much for presenting today. And thank you, Emily, for inviting me. And I thank you all for joining us today. Uh, as Emily mentioned, I'm the careers and personal finance librarian with the Johnson County, Kansas library system. Johnson County is located in the Northeast part of Kansas, and it's a part of the Kansas City, Missouri, Kansas metro area. It has a population of over 600,000 people, and it's largely suburban. And the Johnson County Library is an agency of the county and consists of 14 locations throughout the county. I'm going to talk about a special partnership that we've developed that allows us to provide some valuable programs on financial literacy to our community members. And I'm also going to talk about how we dealt this year with the challenges that COVID-19 presented, which as you know, prevented all of us from offering in-person programs. And during the presentation, I'm going to stop my video so that you can concentrate on the slides and on the presentation. And we're gonna start off, next slide, we're gonna start off with a question for you. How would you categorize your experience providing financial literacy programming, either as beginner, beginning, intermediate, or advanced? Please type your response in the chat. Next slide. As the careers and finance librarian, I facilitate a team of 11 information specialists who work at branches throughout our library system. We used to call ourselves a committee, but we are slowly transitioning to referring to groups within our organization as teams, which seems a little bit less formal and a little bit more collegial to me. Uh, before the pandemic, our team was meeting once a month right after our monthly system-wide information services meeting. Since the pandemic, we've been conducting most of our business through Microsoft Teams and email with an occasional meeting in Teams. Now, the broad mission of the Careers and Personal Finance team is to enrich the lives of our community members by supporting job seekers and by promoting uh, financial literacy. And we do this in a variety of ways. First of all, we stay up to date on career and finance related resources. As we run across new resources, we share these with the team and we add them to our web pages. And especially during these pandemic times, there have been new resources and lots of updates to um, finance related resources. So it really does take a village or in our case, a team to stay up on all of those updates. Uh, another way that we accomplish our mission is by maintaining research web pages. So we have a, a career planning and jobs page and our personal finance page. And then we also maintain a consumer information page, which contains information on scams, fraud, and identity theft with links to the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau and to the FTC. But we also maintain career and finance boards and in branches that don't have the wall space for a board, we have binders and we use these boards and binders to display flyers about our upcoming programs, job listings in the area, job fairs, um, most of which are virtual, 
uh, finance and relief resources and job support programs. We also provide content for our new monthly career and finance e-newsletter. We started offering this last September and it's been a great way to promote our upcoming programs and our library and community resources related to career and financial information. We coordinate and we promote programs and I'll talk more about that in a minute. And then we also nurture community partnerships. Our programming calendar is set up on a trimester basis. Examples of programs that we routinely offer include those on resumes, networking and LinkedIn, interviewing, various aspects of the job search, budgeting, uh, FAFSA and Medicare. By far, our most popular program is the FAFSA program that we usually offer several times in the fall. So obviously there's a real demand for that information. Pre-pandemic, the individual team members would decide which programs they wanted to offer at their branch each trimester, and then they would coordinate all aspects of, that pro of the program. Starting in March, 2020, as you know, our in-person programs were canceled due to COVID. Um, and we uh, were kind of in a waiting period for a time. And then in May, the organization made the decision to pivot to virtual programs and laid the groundwork for it leading up to that. And then, um, one of the full-time members of our career and finance team and I began planning and promoting our virtual programs. I might point out that many of our team members are part-time information specialists and they were furloughed for um, the beginning months in the pandemic. So that just left our full-time information specialists to work on programs. Next. Fortunately, several of our in-person presenters were willing and comfortable presenting online via Zoom. And Dylan Ryder, the other full-time career and finance team member that I mentioned, um, he was willing to jump right in to moderate the programs on Zoom. Currently, all of our programs are being offered virtually and are being recorded. And then the recorded programs are uploaded to our career and finance playlist on Johnson County Library's YouTube channel. So uh, we have links to these programs from our career and personal finance research web pages. And then also you can go directly to our YouTube channel, the Johnson County Library channel. Uh, uh, YouTube channel and see all of these career and finance programs. Uh, so it's one nice thing is that we've been able to expand our reach beyond just the live programs. This is the first time that we've been able to provide recorded programs to, um, to the community. Next. And as I mentioned, we nurture partnerships with community organizations that are involved in supporting job seekers and or promoting financial literacy. And we are fortunate that in our community, we do have some really excellent resources. Examples of these partnerships include Workforce Partnership. It is the organization that has the government contract for developing the workforce in our county. So they work with both the employers and with job seekers to try to match up their needs. We promote the workforce partnership services. And during normal times, we also provide space for and promote their in-person job fairs. Currently, we are promoting their monthly virtual job fairs. 
there's also an organization, the Women's Employment Network, that supports women in establishing their career direction through a series of personal and professional development workshops. And currently they are offering their workshops on, online and we promote these. Uh, the Society of Human Resource Management in Johnson County uh, consists of human resource professionals throughout the Johnson County area. And we've partnered with, partnered with them on resumes and interviewing programs in which attendees had a chance to meet one-on-one -on -one with a local human resource professional to have their resume reviewed or to do a mock interview. Those were very successful programs and well attended. Catholic Charities is another community organization. They offer support, job support services and they also offer financial education programs. We promote these programs and from time to time we invite them to present a program at the library. AARP Kansas Tax Aid um, is another one of our big partners. We provide space for the volunteers to be trained and also to prepare tax returns during tax season. And we also assist with making tax preparation appointments via our telephone reference um, service and at our, at our physical service desk. And then Money Smart KC is a group that has developed and maintains an awesome website with free regional resources on any money related topic you can think of. It's just at moneysmartkc.org. I would highly recommend, I don't think I added that to our resource list, but I would highly recommend that you check that out. Um, next. And I have another question for you. If you currently have partnerships, who do you partner with? Please share your response in chat. Next. One of our strongest partnerships, the one that we're focusing on for this presentation, is with a credit counseling service in our region. About eight years ago, one of their staff members reached out to me about partnering um, with them to present a series which they had developed to promote financial literacy for women. And the series was called Women and Money. Housing and Credit Counseling Inc., which I'll refer to as HCCI, is headquartered in our state capital, which is Topeka, Kansas, with offices in several other cities in Kansas. The agency counsels tenants and landlords and home buyers, as well as consumers seeking to manage their money, get out of debt, improve their credit score, and overall just become more financially stable. Next. HCCI's Women in Money series was developed by women for women. In 2008, HCCI invited a group of women to help them revise the Women in Money series that had been developed and presented in the late 80s and 90s. The group of women led by HCCI staff included representatives from local banks and credit unions, attorneys, Kansas, uh, Kansas County Extension Family and Consumer Science Agents, and the FDIC in Kansas City. It was initially and continues to be funded through grants from organizations and state agencies, as well as contributions from local banks and credit unions. In 2010, HCCI began partnering with their local library system the Topeka and Shawnee County Public Library to promote and present the Women in Money program. And um, those of you who um, have been around a while remember that 2010, we were still in the midst of the um, after effects of the, of the 2008 recession. So there was a real need for finance related information. 
In 2014, HCCI reached out to me at the Johnson County Library with the intention to expand their reach into a new service area. They explained that they would do the heavy lifting in terms of funding and coordinating the series. And at the time, I didn't have a committee or team. So I was the only one promoting the career and finance resources and coordinating the programs. So I really didn't have the capacity to take on a new series of programs, but HCCI um, assumed responsibility for, uh, next, obtaining grants and sponsors. Um, and I've already mentioned that those were mostly from uh, state agencies and also local banks and credit unions. They also assume responsibility for coordinating with, this, coordinating with the state agencies and community organizations and with the staff presenters from those agencies and organizations. They took responsibility for developing promotional materials that we could share with our patrons and our sponsors. And those consisted of flyers, signage, a big banner, web content and social media blurbs. Uh, they also um, assumed responsibility for creating a handbook for each year's program. And this handbook um, looks a little different each year, but initially it um, contained sponsor acknowledgements, objectives for each class, the PowerPoint slides for each class, the presenter pictures and bios, and then helpful resources and websites for each of the different topics. They also took on responsibility for coordinating and paying for the food and beverages served at the series and for creating evaluations for each class in the series and then tabulating those evaluations. And then at the end of the series, they uh, created a summary report with attendance figures and evaluation responses. And this report is used to report back to sponsors and to share with the library administration and with the library board. So as you can see, they were willing to take on a lot of the responsibilities. And it was really um, uh, an offer that for partnering that was difficult to refuse, maybe impossible to refuse. So next, Johnson County Library assumed responsibility for providing the meeting room or rooms and um, the audio visual support. Um, we also assumed responsibility for promoting the series through our channels, which include a printed guide and uh, flyers, uh, online, uh, our online events calendar and promotions on our website, e-newsletters. We have a library-wide e-newsletter. And then just recently, we added the career and finance e-newsletter. Uh, we submit our programs to community calendars. Money Smart KC has a community calendar that we always uh, submit our programs to. And also there's a local online newspaper that um, has a great reach, especially in our county that we use to promote our programs and services. We also agreed to maintain registration through our events calendar and to uh, send out reminders uh, before the program. Uh, we also create displays of library materials to promote the series, series in advance of the series and then also on the day of the programs so that attendees have uh, relevant materials to check out. We also agreed to provide staff and volunteers on the day or days of the event and during normal times, staff greet and check in attendees, help with food and beverage setup and cleanup, distribute and collect evaluations and 
take photos of the event and track attendance and just answer questions for attendees. Next. So in 2014, we began offering the Women in Money program in the fall as a series of evening programs or classes at our central resource library, which has a large meeting room. This series in general consists of classes or programs on these basic topics, budgeting, credit reports and scores, banking and borrowing money, investing, wills and power of attorney, basic simple estate planning, and insurance. Next. The programs are presented by staff from HCCI, government agencies, primarily from the state of Kansas, and nonprofit organizations. So for instance, the classes on budgeting and on credit reports are presented by HCCI, um, HUD exam certified credit counselors. These are the very people who work with um, HCCI clients um, to help them with credit and debt issues. The banking and lending uh, classes are presented by staff member from the office of the Kansas Bank Commissioner. The investing classes are presented by a staff member from the Kansas Securities Commission. The insurance classes um, are presented by a staff member from the Kansas Department of Insurance. And then the wills and powers of attorney class are presented by an elder law attorney from Kansas Legal Services, which is our local legal aid service. And I'll mention that you'll notice none of these are from for-profit um, organizations. And we are very, very careful about who we allow to present for the library, especially when it comes to personal finance topics. We want to make sure that our patrons are getting unbiased information from people who have no other agenda than to educate and inform. Okay. Through the years, the series has evolved under the guidance of Lynn Crabtree, who is HCCI's grant writer and communications manager. Lynn is the brains and the force behind the Women in Money series. And no presentation on women and money would be complete without a shout out um, to Lynn Crabtree. The partnership has also evolved and through the years, JCL has provided some of the funding for uh, providing, for bringing in keynote speakers um, and for covering food and beverage expenses. We've provided more input on speakers and we've also provided library staff more recently to present on library resources. So for the first four years, we presented Women in Money as a series of evening classes over a six to seven week period. The first year, attendance ranged from nine to 24 women per class. The next year, the attendance range was 39 to 50 women per class. So we saw a healthy, increase in attendance. And I think a lot of this was just word of mouth, um, figuring out ways to better promote the program. In 2017, we added a panel discussion to kick off the series. And that year, attendance ranged from 50 women per class to 73 women per class. And then in 2018, 
we decided to present the series as a Saturday event with a keynote speaker. Next. We invited Mary Hunt to be the keynote speaker. And um, we selected her by doing a search of our catalog for female authors of books on personal finance. And we discovered that Mary was the author of at least 23 personal finance books. And so we reached out to her and she was delighted to, uh, to receive the invitation and to um, come to Kansas City to present. Um, as I mentioned, she is a prolific author. Um, her perhaps most well-known book is Debt Proof Living. And she kicked off the day with a presentation and a Q&A. And she has a very inspirational story um, about how she worked her way out of being deep in debt. And I'm talking about tens of thousands of dollars in debt. Um, and she's a wonderful speaker and her talk was very well received. Um, here's an example of a comment that one of the attendees wrote on an evaluation form that it was life-changing, dynamic, and dramatic presentation that was perfect timing for me. Thanks. And she even added some hand-drawn hearts with dollar signs in the middle of them just to um, emphasize how happy she was and thankful for the program. In the afternoon, after a complimentary box lunch was served to all the attendees, they had the opportunity to choose from multiple sessions on budgeting, credit, and money management. And then library staff members for the first year gave 20 minute mini talks on ways to save money by using free library resources for entertainment, learning, and creating. 112 women attended that first Women in Money Day. Next. So the day format was such a success that we decided to offer Women in Money Day again in 2019. And that year, we were fortunate to be able to bring in Helene Olin to give the keynote address. Uh, Helene is a columnist for the Washington Post. She's also the author of Pound Foolish, Exposing the Dark Side of the Personal Finance Industry, which if you haven't read it, I would highly encourage that you do so. It really provides a nice um, evolution and overview of the personal finance industry. And she's also the co-author of the index card, why personal finance doesn't have to be complicated. And in that, in the index card, Helene and her co-author point out that the correct financial advice for most people fits on a three by five index card and is available for free at the library. Great words. Next. In the afternoon, after complimentary box lunches were provided, individual sessions on a variety of finance related topics were presented. And again, library staff presented 20 minute what we called Find It Here talks, promoting online courses, career resources, entertainment materials, and our maker space as ways to save money by using free library resources, many of which we discover on a daily basis, the general public doesn't realize is available to them and is available for free. Next, 97 women attended Women in Money Day 2019. And for the first time that year, 
10 incarcerated women from the adult residential center were able to attend, um, which pleased us greatly. Thanks to the arrangements made by our incarcerated services librarian. And again, many of the attendees provided comments about their experience. And I've included a few of these on this slide. And they asked us to keep doing this. In fact, at the end of the day, one woman sought me out to thank JCL and HCCI for offering it, the event and shared that this was the fourth year that she had attended Women in Money, that each year she learned something new and that she had saved hundreds of dollars, perhaps more, by following up on the information provided in this program. So those were great words for us to hear, especially at the end of a long day um, that really um, was very rewarding for us. Next. So we had planned to offer Women in Money Day again in 2020. I guess you suspect what's coming. <laughs> we had set the date for October 3rd and plans were well underway because we begin planning um, almost as soon as the previous Women in Money series has concluded. So we were full steam ahead when in March COVID-19 struck and we had to rethink if and how we could offer the series. As always, Lynn Crabtree with HCCI, the driving force, was full of ideas for how to proceed within the limitations imposed by the pandemic. Next. Recognizing that the pandemic was having an economic impact on all, men and women alike, Lynn suggested that we make the series inclusive to all. Now, this is an idea that we had been batting around for several years. And this year seemed like the perfect time to make this idea a reality. And to highlight this inclusivity, we decided to redo the logo, which you notice the previous logo had lots of um, of swirly letters and lots of pink. Um, so our graphic artists for the library created new logos for Women in Money and for Women in Money Mondays. Next. We decided to offer Women in Money virtually as a series. Recognizing that it's difficult for any of us to sit in front of a computer for a day long event, we decided instead to offer the virtual programs in bite sized chunks with a kickoff event on Saturday morning, October 3rd, as we had originally planned, followed by a series of Monday evening webinars starting in October and ending in May 2021. And we decided to call these Monday webinars, Money Mondays. Several months into the pandemic, Johnson County Library had purchased a new presentation platform on 24. And it was decided that this platform would be used for the newly rebranded Women in Money series. The On24 platform has some cool features, but there was a learning curve for the JCL events coordinator and also for the other staff who were using the program. Fortunately, our career and finance team member, Dylan Ryder, who I mentioned earlier and who I hope is um, attending the program today, he stepped up and agreed to moderate the series on On24. 
Next. We had already confirmed the keynote speaker and we're really looking forward to having her. Carol Cando Pineda is an attorney with the Federal Trade Commission's Business and Education Division. I had met Carol through a Web Junction webinar that I had co-presented with her. So we reached out to her and she agreed to present. The original plan was for Carol to fly in from DC to do a keynote on scams, fraud, and identity theft. Instead, Carol agreed to present virtually from her home in the DC area. And we left the keynote at the originally scheduled time, the morning of Saturday, October 3rd. Carol's talk was entitled, How to Spot and Stop Scams. And in light of the pandemic related scams and identity theft schemes, um, it turned out that this topic was especially an especially timely one. And Carol was able to include some of those pandemic specific schemes uh, and scams in her presentation. 30 people attended the live Women in Money kickoff event. Next. The kickoff was followed by Money Mondays webinars presented on Monday evenings from 6 to 7 p.m. Investing and investment fraud webinar was presented by the Chief of Compliance from the Kansas Securities Commissioner and we had 17 attendees. The insurance webinar was presented by the Director of Government Affairs from the Kansas Department of Insurance. 29 people attended the live program. Credit reports and scores presented by a, a HUD examined certified counselor from HCCI had 34 attendees and then budgeting and saving presented by another HCCI credit counselor had 46 attendees. And you'll notice that the attendance was trending up with each webinar and I attribute this in part to people getting adjusted to the new format of the series and to having more time to um, become aware of, this, of the series. Next. The Money Mondays webinars continue in the new year with one per month, January through May. January's webinar was on getting out of debt and was presented by an attorney whose law firm specializes in debt collection and resolution. February's webinar is on banking basics, how to choose a financial institution, and it'll be presented by the Director of Community Affairs for the Kansas State Bank Commission. March's webinar uh, covers landlord and tenant law and it'll be presented by the manager of HCCI's tenant and landlord counseling and education program. And then in April, an HCCI credit counselor will talk about how to budget when you have an irregular income. And then May's webinar provides information on money apps that you can use to help manage your money. And it'll be presented by and HCCI credit counselor. Next. Now, as is almost always true when trying something new and different, we ran into some challenges. Uh, promoting, just getting communications out in the middle of the pandemic so that people could understand the switch from the in-person day event to the virtual series and how that all works, I think took some time Registration, um, we had we would have high registration figures, and then we were disappointed that only about 25 to 40 percent of those who signed up actually attended the live programs. We installed uh, or we switched over to a new events calendar last summer, and it has a lot of great features, but we discovered an issue that whenever changes were made to any program details that any of the people who had registered up to that point, their registrations didn't transfer over to the revised description. So we lost some registrants. Bummer. Uh, we also discovered that maybe 
Uh, the time, 6 to 7 p.m., might be a tough time for live viewing, especially for those people who were um, still going out um, outside the home to work and then having to come home and make dinner perhaps for themselves or their family members. Uh, we had uh, several rescheduled Chiefs games that conflicted with our Money Mondays webinars, several of our Money Mondays webinars. Now, those of you who are football fans know that Kansas City has a great football team. The Kansas City Chiefs won the Super Bowl last year, and they're heading to the Super Bowl again this year. So their games are must-see events. And several of their games had to be rescheduled for Monday afternoon and evening. And as I mentioned, those conflicted with our Money Monday webinars. And there was also a learning curve on On24. So much we didn't know, features we didn't know how to use, reports we didn't know how to access, those kinds of things. And also limitations of the On24 platform. There is limited opportunity for interaction with attendees. Presenters can't see attendees or interact with them other than through the Q&A. So they don't even have the capability to do as much as give a thumbs up, the attendees, to the presenters. Um, next. Happily, we also discovered some silver linings of pivoting to virtual programs. We were able to more readily make it inclusive to all. We were able to record and provide archived links to the recorded programs. And all this enabled us to extend our reach beyond the, long, the, beyond the live program time, beyond people who couldn't or wouldn't attend an in-person event <clears throat> due to disability or discomfort, and also beyond our metro area. So realizing that we could um, reach far beyond our metro area to attract attendees, we reached out to the Kansas library system. And in Kansas, the library system is divided into regions. Our library is located within the Northeast Kansas library system, also known as NECLS. And so we have been working with NECLS to promote the webinar series throughout the state of Kansas through the other regional library systems. And as a result of all of the above, we have been able to more widely promote the free counseling services offered by HCI, HCCI to help people with evictions, debt, credit, budgets, et cetera, which are um, problems that or challenges that many people are experiencing during this pandemic. Next. One moment. Okay. So we were able to pivot to virtual programming for the 2020 and 2021 Women in Money series. Who knows what lies ahead for next fall series? The only thing that we know for sure is that the partnership and the series will continue to evolve and we will continue to pivot to meet those challenges. Okay. Emily Moross is going to facilitate the Q&A. If you don't have a question to ask yet, I invite you to share your responses to these two questions. What has been the most challenging aspect of pivoting to remote or virtual programming? And what is the most popular topic for your financial literacy programs? Please put your responses in the chat. Thanks so much, Marty. Um, one of the first questions that I see is asking if you compensated the speakers that you've hired. For this series, no, because as I mentioned, they are um, 
staff from nonprofit and from government agencies. Um, and even our this year, our uh, keynote speaker is a staff member for the FTC and is not able to accept any kind of honorarium. Uh, for keynote speakers in past years, uh, Mary Hunt and Helene Olin, we were able to provide them with honorariums. Thanks. Um, we got some Go Chiefs and Go Andy reading the chat. Um, and, <laughs> and, uh, Robert uh, from FINRA said that uh, having uh, budgeting for an irregular income is a really great topic. So uh, kudos for that and some others uh, that said that that's a great topic to focus on. Um, Paige says, I understand that the library reached out to nonprofit groups, but also lawyers. Did you find it easy to find a lawyer who wanted to present and work with the library for free? Uh, well, the, the main lawyer that we've been working with for the last six years works for Kansas Legal Services, which, um, again, is a nonprofit organization. And actually, she's required as part of her um, list of responsibilities to do some, um, to provide some public information programs. So she is more than happy to um, present for the library. Um, now, as far as the attorney that is that just presented our um, program on getting out of debt, HCCI made the arrangements with her. And I think um, she was one of the original people who served on the committee back in 2008 to update the HCCI's Women in Money series. And so I think uh, she um, has the right um, orientation for wanting to help just because she is that kind of person. Um, and so I think it's, it's based on uh, some of these presenters are willing to present because um, partnerships have been nurtured with them and relationships have been nurtured with them and their organizations. And they tend to be public service oriented as well. Thanks. And I would uh, just to some of the other comments that Paige put in the chat, and um, there's lots of great responses there um, about trying to find people to partner with as well. Um, I would say reach out to some of our national organizations as well, like the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. I noticed in the chat a lot of people said that they were partnering with them. They're very well connected to lots of different communities around the country. And so they may know of people or organizations or agencies like those that Marty has been working with in your area who would be willing and actually as part of what they do to come and speak with your patrons for free. Um, yeah. So that's what I, that would be my first line of recommendation would be to, to contact the CFPB and get in contact with someone there to see if they can get you in contact with some people in your local area. Um, Robert asks, beyond the numbers in attendance, have you noticed any changes in the demographic makeup of your audiences after shifting to virtual programs? Well, unfortunately, we, um, we were trying to capture um, whether we were pulling in people from beyond our metro area. So we have asked people to um, submit their area, uh, their zip codes so that we can get a feel for where people um, who are attending the live webinars are, are from. But we haven't asked for any other, normally in um, previous years, we've always asked for demographic information about age and all of that. But because of the limitations of one hour to do a presentation and Q&A, and we also have some other polling questions that we ask, a total of usually six, we have not um, been asking specific demographic questions beyond the zip code of the attendees. 
And we'd love that information. We just haven't been able to squeeze it in. Um, and another question, has the library been able to focus on training and professional development on personal finance topics for library and staff? And Robert, we do have a blog post coming up on Programming Librarian about this by one person who is currently here with us today. Hi, Kristen. <laughs> you know, that's a wonderful question. Our approach up to this point has been, we're not the experts. We're the librarians and the information specialists who stay abreast of the resources and services that, and organizations, et cetera, that serve um, people who are looking for jobs and trying to improve their uh, money management skills. So we have not been ourselves presenting on those topics. We've gotten to the point where we have listened in on enough programs and we have gathered enough information that some of us feel that we are in a position that we could present on some of these basic topics. So that's going to be um, a topic for discussion going forward. So I'm not seeing any other questions at this moment, but we do have a lot of really great sharing. Oh, we now have a question, but there's a ton of awesome uh, sharing going on in the chat about the programs that are really popular and successful. I'm seeing a lot of estate mm. planning and wills are a really big topic. And a big challenge are communities that have um, maybe unreliable or uneven and unequal access to internet services. Um, so that's a challenge or people not registering for programs. Uh, so our question here, which uh, we still have a little bit of time, have you had programs to teach young adults in grades six through 12 financial literacy? And if so, do you have any tips on how to create the programs and what they will attend? Um, long story short, we, our career and finance team doesn't have, doesn't offer any programs to that age group. We have, for the last several years, been exploring ways we can better reach out. And I'm happy to say we're making progress. We currently have um, a youth specialist who recently joined our career and finance team. And so we are hoping that we can do more collaboration in the future with our youth services folks, because I believe that financial literacy education should begin in preschool. And I know that there are tons of resources out there to address those age groups. Now, the one program that we have that is appropriate for um, high school students and their parents are the FAFSA programs. And as I mentioned, they are our most popular programs. Um, and then another, we've also uh, done a survey of our community. And um, fortunately, the one of the biggest school districts in our Johnson County area has made a financial, taking a financial literacy course in high school, a requirement. Effective, I think, the year that my own daughter graduated, unfortunately, <laughs> because I think everybody could benefit from that. So um, we are working with the school districts to kind of supplement the work that they are doing. Thanks. Yeah, I definitely agree. And I see some other agreements in the chat that we need to provide um, programming and curriculum in the schools, especially from K to 12 for students on financial literacy. Um, so I don't see any more questions in the chat and we are just about at three o'clock. Um, so I think we can probably wrap up um, in the chat. We do have a reminder this will be archived and will be available in about 24 hours on programminglibrarian.org. 
Um, I want to thank Marty again for presenting and thanks everyone for attending. Um, and I do thank see I, my email inbox blew up a little bit. We've got some people that want to join the group. Um, so we look forward to seeing everybody for our next session with the FLIG webinars, which will be in March. Thank you all for joining us. This and this is Sarah again from ALA. I just wanted to thank Marty and Emily both so much for this great um, hour long presentation. Thanks to the Financial Literacy Interest Group and to the FINRA Foundation for making this possible. Hope everyone has a great rest of your day. Thanks. Bye, everyone.